Um, so see. these documents landed in Andy Webb's uh, email inbox last night, late on. He's been very quickly going through them. Even so far, it seems the revelations are pretty significant. But why would they need to be so redacted, Roger? Because the BBC have said they aren't relevant. There's very, it's, it's nothing to do with it. Well, why have you redacted so much of it then? Right. Would you like every email that you've sent in your present job uh, to be collected and published? Uh, I think already, yes. You know, no, hang oh, on. No, I'm, no don't, let me answer one. that question. I very much maintain that you should never commit anything on email that you wouldn't be happy for the public to see. And people in the BBC should know that at the very basic level of communication. Well, that's a very sensible approach, but fortunately most people don't do it. And there are genuine privacy concerns. It's a question of trust. Should you trust the BBC that it has redacted some things, um, not to, as part of a cover-up? That's the issue. I don't think it's surprising that they've covered a great deal up because you know if you're going to it's like around a cabinet table or whatever if you're going to have a free and frank exchange of views you between people you you, you, you must think that uh, it's going to be reported in the press the next day in detail or government or whatever you've got to allow a little space where to people can talk about their private problems supposing for example i'd have a divorce and troubles and that was in an email well you would take that out wouldn't you and and there are lots of personal details so the principle of redacting is sensible the question is do you trust the organization only to redact those things Roger, which really are acts of privacy what creates suspicion i think for most people watching and listening is um the bbc say these all of this stuff is irrelevant so why did they fight tooth and nail to keep this information covered up at a cost, uh, Andy, Andy Marsh says he thinks probably a quarter of a million pounds has been spent on lawyers' fees to try and keep these emails and documents covered up. Of course they're relevant because they show that the BBC was trying to cover up the scale of the duplicity of Martin Bashir. Well, you say that having, of course, not read them, Andrew. So you assert this as a fact, and it's your, it may be well founded, but it's your suspicion. No, no. Just I'm, I'm, well, a fact, which isn't a fact. Well, we know what Lord, let's, we, let's, we, let's we know what Lord Dyson said. Ah, no. Lord Dyson was talking about the period about two, about twenty-five years ago, after the interview, which took mm. place almost twenty-eight years ago, mm. and Lord Dyson was correctly excoriating about the cover-up that did indeed happen in the BBC, which was a disgrace. Mm. But that is almost twenty-five years ago. The question is: Is the BBC now covering up? I mean, I congratulate Andy Webb on his mm. pursuit of the story, well worth doing. But I don't think, I don't think we've got evidence of a contemporary or a last two years cover up. There might be, I, I, you know, who knows? I don't think there will be, but we haven't got evidence of that. Why, what why? we do know is there was a disgraceful cover up in the what? past. Well, why would they not just simply release some of these documents? Why would Andy have to have fought so hard, long and hard, involving vast amounts of public money, Roger, if there was no attempt, perhaps, to gloss over some of the facts? Was, well, well after Lord Hall left, who we know was part, head of director of news in 96 when there was the cover-up, uh, when, when, when Tim Davey took over, did he try and um, clean it up? Tim Davey did not take over until about, what, 18 years after Tony Hall departed yeah. um, that job. So I don't think Tim Davey, I trust Tim Davey, that's first of all. I don't think he'd be part of a cover-up. And I think the moment this broke, he got Lord Dyson in, Lord Dyson saw all of the emails, all of the documents, and produced this report, which isn't excoriating. It's not impossible that there are, it's not impossible that there are emails held back, which would be, show a contemporary cover-up, but I don't think it's likely. Uh, I, obviously, it's a possibility. I don't think it's likely. What we can agree was it was disgrace that happened. But by the way, on the latest bit of news, when Martin Bashir excuses what he did on the basis of, as it were, there were professional jealousy, those were the people. Of course, there's professional jealousy. There always is. And I was editor of Panorama, and it was pretty tough when I did it. Of course, there is. But hold on. That doesn't excuse what Martin did or the genuine criticisms of, of his forging documents, lying to the princess and behaving in an utterly disgraceful way. Roger, do you have any idea what the BBC's relationship with Bashir is? Was, was he actually fired for this? Is he, does he get a pension? Will he get a pension for the BBC? Mm. Do, you, do you have any idea what that relationship has been left like? Uh, I don't know. What I do know is that it, it, he had a very serious... People talk about, you know, how come he can be sending emails to everybody and yet he can't uh, give, you know, testimony. Mm. I think the truth is he had a very serious heart operation, very serious. And whether such a person is up to legal scrutiny for a former judge, I don't know. 
he says he isn't. It's entirely possible. It's also possible, however, he could at home give a great deal of information about what he's done, which he has chosen not to do. So mm. both things are true. He's not fit enough to go in front of a judge. He could have cooperated a lot more. And he's clearly delusional if he doesn't recognise that what he did was entirely wrong and extraordinarily mm. damaging. And changed the course of history, Roger. Literally no, changed the whole the course no. of history and the relationship that that woman went on to have with her sons, with her ex-husband, with the royal family, with her future partners. Do you not agree? No, I disagree entirely. And I'll tell you why. The, the, the marriage had also uh, already between uh, Diana and Charles had broken down irretrievably. She was determined to get her story out. She recorded sound tapes and gave them to uh, Bro uh, Andrew Morton. She went and talked to people like Max Hastings, who's gone on the record. Mm. She wanted to give the interview. So there's no question she would have given an interview. There's a legitimate question, which is, if she hadn't been fed the lies by Bashir, would she have gone quite as far as she went? Mm. Quite. But she would have given the interview. And a second thing where I do disagree, uh, I think with Andy Webb, and I do disagree with Earl Spencer and so on, um, is this idea that you can tra trace a direct line between that interview and her death in Paris. Mm. I don't think you can. That's far too far. But Andy you can, Webber, but you can but trace you... an interview. The princess was vulnerable, mentally vulnerable, we know that, and her paranoia about people spying on her was fed by the lies peddled to her by the BBC's panorama presenter, Martin Bashir, without a doubt. Uh, without a doubt. And I would say one other thing, though, we all ought to think about. She was 19 when she got married. Society wanted a virgin bride. Mm. You know, they, were, they didn't, worry about Charles, didn't worry about Charles having previous affairs. We're all complicit in creating a fairy tale. Fairy tales aren't true. Mm. Just finally, Roger, um, the reason this interview made such reverberations around the world was because it was conducted on the BBC. People trusted the BBC. It was a worldwide famous institution. This has shattered, hasn't it, a lot of people's faith in the BBC? Uh, it's over 25 years ago, so let's get this. There is a campaign against the BBC by The Telegraph and The Mail. Trust in the BBC is still extraordinarily high, but it was extremely damaging. It was a disgraceful episode. The cover-up was disgraceful, but it was 20 years. The cover-up was 20, 25 years ago. And I do not believe, I hope I'm not being naive, I do not, not believe that this director general would be part of a cover-up today. But the mm. crucial thing from all of this is, don't let anybody mark their own homework. Always have an external mm. regulator. Uh, we've mm. learned that time and time again. No institution can be trusted because, like the Roman Catholic Church, that Church of England, over mm. sexual abuse. The instinct to protect the institution, and you persuade yourself it's the right thing to do, mm. is, is fatal. Get an external regulator, be open, Mm. answer these people of information, and if it happens that they have deliberately held back this time anything mm. of vital and real importance, that will absolutely shatter the reputation of the BBC. I don't think they have. I hope they haven't.